My background is in landscape design. I have a degree in landscape architecture and have had a private practice in the Pioneer Valley that's focused on um, design and installation. And two years ago, I helped found a nonprofit that is focused on building gardens in public locations using volunteers and using funding that is from within the community so that it doesn't, so we don't have to depend on funding from outside sources. And so I'm going to show you some slides of some of the work that we've done and also just tell you a little bit about or kind of give you a quick sense of what that backstory is in terms of my professional background. But really the focus of, of my time up here is on um, showing an example or sort of basically what ends up being a template, a model for how towns, municipalities, communities can um, affect change really quickly especially in an area like the Pioneer Valley where there's a lot of people that are really actively interested in this sort of thing. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background. I started a landscape design company in this area called Tree Frog Landscapes um, and we did a project at River Valley Market in Northampton and the offer that was made to River, Mal River Valley Market was um, we will we will organize work days, and if you bring, if you get volunteers, we'll provide a workshop and then show everybody how to plant everything. And so we were actually able to do this in a uh, in a very full way, in that we planted that volunteers planted that entire parking lot. So including things as um, as big as ten foot red oak trees that got planted there. There were volunteers that were um, chipping away digging into basically what was rock because it's an old quarry site. So people put in hundreds of hours there. And um, we were also able to get plants donated in that instance from Nasami Farm. And so we were able to um, bring in about 500 perennials that otherwise wouldn't have been on site. And so what ended up happening was there was a lot of color and a lot of life there on this site. And this was something um, that was very encouraging and pretty exciting because people were, the participants were all very enthusiastic and the co-op saved themselves probably easily tens of thousands of dollars in labor and also plant material um, because a lot of the plants were donated. And so segue into the future. I uh, started a second business after I left Tree Frog Landscapes and I needed to um, get some traction and let people know that this business existed. And I approached the owner of Cooper's Corner in Florence, Massachusetts um, and basically said, if you uh, are interested, I'll provide you a design and an estimate and if you like it, we'll, I'll build it basically at cost. So if you pay for materials, um, I'll build the project. And so Rich Cooper um, went along with that and we built this landscape. And what happened when we were building the landscape was that the outpouring of appreciation from people walking um, on the street day in, day out while we were working was pretty over the top. It was ranging from um, kids to um, adults to all walks of life. Um, in a way that was really articulate and kind of surprising. You know, there was this really high level of appreciation. And so uh, these two dots that I kind of mentioned, I connected them and was thinking, wow, we have this incredible um, amount of enthusiasm in the Pioneer Valley for uh, plants, for things related to the landscape, for ecology, and certainly for things like pollinators. And I spearheaded creating a nonprofit that basically takes the same the model that I've been mentioning, which is volunteers, funding from a local source, and a professional design, and take those things to, and put them together to create public gardens. And so the, the flagship garden that we did for the nonprofit that was created, which is named Local Harmony, Local Harmony um, worked with the Hungry Ghost Bakery and also Smith College, which owns that property, which is on State Street in Northampton. And we um, 
we built this entire garden there, which is actually a, a medicinal garden. Every plant in that garden is filled with um, plants that are used for medicinal um, cures and that sort of thing. And um, we built the entire garden with volunteers. And all of the fundraising came from inside the community. And there was, again, a really high level of support in doing that. And so we kind of kept running with that. Um, we've been working with the Hitchcock Center. Um, and we've been working in Turner's Falls, too. One of the really interesting footnotes that I want to mention here is that there needs to be so much more research, as Robert was mentioning, when it comes to pollinators. This garden is a medicinal garden. What happened was it attracted more pollinators than any garden I'd ever seen, that, that I'd ever built personally over the course of two decades. And what that leads me to believe is that pollinators, including most of these pollinators are actually native pollinators, even though not all of the plants are native plants. It seems as though the pollinators are drawn to these particular plants because they have medicinal value. So the actual nectar that's coming from these plants, the pollen that's coming from these plants very well could be beneficial to the actual pollinators themselves. And there's research um, from a very well-known mycologist in the last year or so, Paul Stamets, that is showing that bees actually will collect mycelium, which is the living body of mushrooms, and take the mycelium, beneficial mycelium, back to their hives and use it as a way to offset negative, uh, negative uh, fungi mm -hmm that would be detrimental to the hive from growing in the hive. And so there's this whole world of um, how pollinators interact with plants that we don't even really know yet. And so this was eye-opening to me to see the, um, the effect that these plants had on pollinators and how, how um, much they were used. So here's another example. There are a lot of actual native plants in here. That's cardinal flower that you see in the foreground. And here's an example. This is Angelica gigas, which is uh, actually a Korean, I think, uh, plant in its native habitat. But um, we're very careful, of course, to not use anything invasive. But there are certain species that are uh, perfectly uh, orderly that you never really know how pollinators are going to interact with them. So like I was saying just a minute ago, here's an example of a lot of native pollinators showing up on a plant that um, they basically just swarmed it constantly. It was pretty astonishing. Um, here's a scropia moth on some wood betony. Wood betony is actually a native. This is also from the Hungry Ghost Garden. So this next slide is a shot from Turner's Falls in Montague. And three years ago, um, Local Harmony took on a project where we were uh, started working with the horticulture program from the tech school, Franklin County Tech School in Turner's Falls. And there are planters in downtown Turner's Falls, for those who aren't familiar with Turner's, and they're roughly 20 by 10 feet or so, and they line the main street in Turner's Falls. So what you're seeing here in this slide is one of those planters, and a, a number of them were neglected and needed um, renovation. And so with the students from the horticulture program, we made those renovations and we raised money from businesses that are in town um, to buy plants. And so Local Harmony made those plants available at cost and all the labor was provided um, by volunteers. So in that case, we're able to do something that is of professional grade for a very low cost, uh, basically as low a cost as you could possibly do it unless you were growing the plants from scratch yourself, which is something always to keep in mind. If you can grow plants, then you get free plants. <laughs> so here's, a, um, here's another planter in front of the Country Creamy in Turner's Falls. And um, we've basically gone around and renovated over the course of three years uh, all the planters that were in, in need of renovation. And we've added over 800 perennials uh, and we also have brought in about 10 or, or so volunteers that in addition to the volunteers who are already taking care of these, uh, some of the planters in Turner's Falls, 
um, there's now 10 more people actually taking care of them. And that is one of the most important things about um, really any project that goes in the landscape. There has to be a actionable plan that of course makes sense from an installation perspective and has to be realistic in terms of budget. But none of that really adds up to anything unless it lasts. And so with a lot of, a lot of landscapes, um, people tend to uh, forget that there needs to be a budget, either in time or money or both, to actually take care of the landscape. And so that's really, really important. And in Turner's Falls, because it's a community space, there's people who want to volunteer and do that. And so that's terribly important um, in terms of making some of these projects happen. Here is a monarch uh, caterpillar in downtown Turner's Falls. <laughs> And this fall, we worked on um, a project with Western Mass Pollinator Network and in Pulaski Park in Northampton. And that was our first collaboration directly um, where about 120 perennials were planted to fill in some gaps in that beautiful new park that was built and to um, basically help ensure that it takes properly. And Western Mass Pollinator Network, speaking of maintenance, stepped into the role of actually maintaining that park where there was, uh, for various reasons, a gap in the maintenance. So there was a multi-million dollar park that was built. And it wasn't, um, the, due to contracts and how these things work, it, the, there was not seamlessness in terms of that maintenance. And Western Mass Pollinator Network stepped in and do, did that. And at the same time, we also planted a trial meadow on, the, on Crafts Avenue right next to Town Hall in Northampton. And this is a pollinator meadow and we use plugs in this case, and plugs are small perennials, and they're as inexpensive as you can get in terms of getting plants in the ground without using seed, which is the absolute lowest cost alternative you have. So this is, I think, my last slide, and these, this is a picture of all the um, plants that went into that trial meadow on Crafts Avenue. If it works, um, there's a good chance that we might be able to plant that whole slope. So I think that's it.